committee um, today um, just to advise, there's only a few of us now in the room, so just obviously advise again about maintaining social distancing throughout the meeting. Um, today we will consider subordinate legislation. We'll have a departmental briefing on budget and a departmental briefing on common frameworks. And obviously um, due to the number of members who are joining us via um, via Starleaf, I would ask if members could use the hands up icon to register when they wish to ask questions at each ag agenda item. And also just ensure that um, mics are muted just in, in order for us um, to hear evidence and follow the meeting. Uh, we have Keith Buchanan in um, room 29 with myself and coming via Starleaf we have Martine Anderson, Andrew Muir, Liz Kimmins and um, Roy Beggs and we are expecting Cahill Boylan and Dolores Kelly. Unfortunately they... No, Dolores has joined the meeting. Okay, yeah. you're welcome, Dolores. And we have apologies from the Deputy Chairman, David Hildage, today. I have no Chairman's business. We just move then to draft minutes, and that's the meeting of the 27th of January. Does anyone have any issue or members are content? Content, thank you. Moving then to matters arising, uh, item four. Um, that's at page 13 of your packs. Again, those are the um, issues from the meeting on the 27th of January. Do members have any issues associated with that meeting? Members are content. At page 17, uh, we have outstanding requests um, for information. Uh, there are a number of items which are still outstanding and, and for quite some time and there have been reminder emails issued on a couple of occasions. Um, members will see that. Any, members, any comments from, with regards to that? No? Content? Okay. Thank you. Moving then to correspondence, item five. Just draw your attention to the correspondence memo at page 32. And also tabled at page four in your pack. There are a number of issues there. Um, let me just highlight a couple. And then if members have anything additional they would wish to say. And um, we have correspondence from Northern Ireland Retail just regarding um, a request to meet with us. Um, they want to talk about a number of issues, including the impacts of um, Brexit and COVID. Members are content that we um, make an arrangement for them to come to speak to us. Agreed. Agreed. Yep. Um, at page 67, there's a ministerial response to the correspondence which the committee sent uh, coming out of the meeting of the 13th of January. That's at page 67. Um, the minister has um, covered quite a number of issues. Do members have any comments with regards to that? Chair, sure. can I just say, um, the, the, the letter mentions the criteria for the road safety scheme, and I know um, some of the members in the past have, have mentioned that some of the schemes were denied you know, with the, the road safety grant scheme. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering um, if we maybe could, could get the, a list of, of, um, of those who were unsuccessful and see, because I know that obviously there's, there's maybe funds available still that maybe we could look and see if the department reassess their eligibility. Um, so. Is it something we could look at and see what, who was the night or why? Or if they're if they're willing to look at another scheme? Yeah, yeah. I think it's something. If if, if there's funds available, I think it's it, it would be remiss of us to 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 not try and utilise them. And um, so it's just to, to to raise that. Okay. Any other members? Any comments, yeah. on Mr. Muir? Thank you much, to the chair. I agree with Liz around that. I think. At the time when there is money, I think it's disappointing that those applications were refused. And I think it's, it's important to get our information. Just one other thing: the, there was a letter, um, a document three from the Construction Employers Federation, and there was a response to the budget, and it raised a, quite a significant range of issues, which we'll also probably encounter when we're discussing the budget. And I just don't know whether it would be appropriate to invite uh, representatives from the Construction Employers Federation to um, come to the committee to, to make a presentation because I think these are important issues as we're going ahead and over the year ahead. Okay, are members content that we arrange that? 
Okay. Thank you. Right. Madam Chair. Um, with regard to um, extending uh, potential road safety funding, um, declare an interest as a member of Carrick Road Safety Committee, first of all. But uh, we are a very short time away. I think there would only be about six weeks when the money would actually have to be spent and invoiced um, before the end of the financial year uh, and then allow for that audit and parade. Um, so I uh, would have thought that um, we should be doing a joint thing. One, find out who are um, have been unsuccessful, as has been suggested, happy with that. But at the same time, we should urge the minister to consider reopening. I don't think we need to wait because I think uh, the time is so short. We should be asking that she should consider reopening the scheme uh, whilst we are further investigating ourselves. Okay. I think there's a general consensus in having um, a discussion with her with regards to that to see what can be done. Because um, I think we were all aware of various schemes around um, all our constituencies. Um, Ms. Anderson? Yeah, um, I'm noting the comments around the reservoir audit report and the confidential briefing and arrangements were to be made by the clerk and officials to see how that could be taken forward. Could we have an update as to where that's at? Um, is, is Cathy available for to make comments with regards to that? Yes, yes. Um, the reservoirs audit that was done in 2016, 15 reservoirs were not included in the original audit. And <clears throat> An engineer's report will be finalised by the end of February. So I have discussed this with the Dallo and we have agreed that they will come and brief us on either the 3rd or the 10th of March in closed session. Everyone will have to attend in person. The official will come and hand out all the papers uh, in the meeting and talk you through all the papers. And then you have to hand the papers back before you leave the room again. It's all very confidential. And um, we agreed that it should be a three-hour meeting just for the reservoirs. That's me. Thank you. Um, Ms. Anderson, content with that? Yeah, content, obviously, logistically, um, and the time it would take to read the papers. If it's whatever date is set, we were, we're all probably very mindful of the restrictions that we're operating under, but we have to get our hands on that report and we have to find a mechanism to, to have this engagement. Okay. And also be mindful of the fact that it is confidential. Um, so... Um... If we're if you're content to leave that with with Kathy to make the relevant arrangements with with officials in order to be able to do that, um, you've all still got your hand up. So I'm just wondering whether you're still wanting to ask questions or not. So we've still got Martina, Andrew, and Roy, um, and Kathy's now raised her hand, <laughs> and Kathy's on mute. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me, sir? Um, who am I, who's speaking now? Cal. Cal, okay. Go, go ahead. No, Church, just I know Liz had raised the issues. Apologies, there are a few technical problems, but say in terms of the road safety um, scheme, did, can we ask for the list of the 10 applications that uh, didn't score high enough to be, to be awarded uh, monies? Yeah, can, Liz has asked for additional information. Just sorry, to okay. Sorry, that's no, so okay. Sorry, I didn't see that. So, Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then obviously we're then looking at, at trying to see whether this can be revisited again by the department. Oh, look, I'm okay. mindful Thank of the time you. scale. Okay, any other comments with regards to um, correspondence? Chair, if it's possible. Andrew? Yeah, yeah just in relation to one of the items with 5.10, which was in relation to the um, A1 junctions phase two, obviously we're aware of the announcement that was made last week. And I think we're all united and wanting to see that move forward as quick as possible. Um, I think there were statements made that there was going to be attempts made to see if they could this could be moved at a faster pace than what we were previously told. Maybe it's an point to write to the committee, sorry, write to the department, uh, to ask them for an update on what efforts are being done to expedite the procurement process so this work starts as soon as possible. Uh, well, I suppose it, it's still going through the, the, the processes and they're going to look to publish then the, the environmental impact assessment notice to proceed. Um, and then obviously they'll go through the process of um, vesting orders um, when the funding has been secured. So there's still a number of pros and other steps to be completed in that process. But certainly 
be useful to ask for additional information and a, a more specific timeline. Yeah, that would be very useful to I think. Okay. Any other members on correspondence? Okay. So content that we action as suggested in the, the memo. Okay, great, thank you. Moving then to item six, subordinate legislation. SL1 is not subject to assembly proceedings. At page 97, with the SL1, the waiting restrictions, Bryansford Order, Northern Ireland 2021. And at page 99, with SL1, the schools, part time, 20 mile per hour speed limit, amendment order, Northern Ireland. 2021. As I've said, these, uh, these proposals are not subject to assembly proceedings. The rules will prohibit vehicles waiting at any time, loading and uploading on lengths of the Burnray Road in Bryansford. And the other is in relation to lowering the speed limit to 20 miles per hour outside 103 schools. Are members content um, with the proposals for the statutory rules? Yep. Okay. Um, are members any comments with regard to that? Obviously, the minister yesterday um, gave a commitment to looking for budget for to include further schools in the scheme, um, and obviously we would encourage her to do that and, and, and lend our support to that. And no doubt, members from across the chamber will have an, a list of schools that, um, that they would like included in, in that list. Moving then to item seven which is departmental briefing on budget. Just draw your attention to page 102 with the de uh, department's um, briefing paper 2020-2021 in your monitoring and budget 2021-22, and that was from December 2020. At page 109, we have the Committee for Finance draft budget, um, draft budget 2021-22 scrutiny by statutory committees. Page 114, we have the Department of Finance's draft budget for 21-22. At, tabled at page 13, we have a um, briefing paper from the Department for Infrastructure. And tabled at pages 18 to 24, we have responses from TransLink, Northern Ireland Water, Drainage Council and Waterways Ireland on the draft budget. Just remind members that Hansard will record the meeting. And we'll, we will be welcoming all um, witnesses um, here attending by Starleaf. We have um, Linda McHugh, the Acting Deputy Secretary, Resources, Governance and EU Group. Uh, we have Susan Anderson, Director of Finance. John Irvine, Director of Major Projects and Procurement. And Terry Dean, the Head of Financial Planning and Management. You're all very welcome to the meeting. I don't see any of them at this stage. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Morning, good Terry. Morning. morning, Linda. Good morning. Good morning. I was Susan. And we John. Alright, morning. Okay, uh, Linda, can I ask you then to um, make your opening statement and then we'll follow up with some questions. And again, as per a previous briefing, can I look to you then to, to delegate yes. to those who may wish to answer relevant questions? Yeah, that, that's fine, Chair. So thank you for the opportunity to brief the committee this morning on the department's in-year budget position and the draft budget outcome for next year. And as you said, I, I'm joined by Susan, Terry and John this morning. Um, so I want to begin with an update on January monitoring. In our last finance briefing to the committee on the 13th of January, I set out the department's submission on January monitoring, the outcome of which has now been announced. One resource bid for increased holiday carry forward was submitted, and I understand that this bid will be met centrally by Treasury and for the whole of the civil service. As you will know, we took the opportunity to make the Department of Finance aware of some additional COVID pressures in our January monitoring submission. Further pressures of 1.9 million for lost parking income in roads and a small amount of PPE costs and DVA were registered. More importantly, we highlighted to the Department of Finance that DVA had utilised 10 million uh, pounds in reserves to supplement lost income due to COVID and 
unless that was reinstated, future capital investment may be hampered. We have been allocated an additional £12 million to address these pressures. Since the January monitoring round was submitted, the Department has undertaken a further assessment of the financial position across both the Department and its ALBs in light of the amount of funding available at the centre. And two further bids were, were put forward to the Department of Finance to help maintain the financial stability of Translink and DVA. Um, we have been successful in securing an additional £50 million pounds for Translink um, and uh, £10 million pounds for DVA. Um, and um, £35 million pounds had originally been agreed and then another £15 million was agreed by the executive yesterday. Both Translink and DVA have had to eat into reserves to survive financially this year, and this additional budget will replenish the depleted reserves and provide a degree of financial resilience as we head into another year in which we expect further impacts as a result of COVID-19. Turning now to next year and the 2021-22 budget, the executive announced the draft 2021-22 budget on the 18th of January. The department's resource income was, or resource outcome, sorry, was very disappointing, um, with just an increase of 2.8 million on the 21-22 opening position. This 0.7% uh, increase is proportionately less than all the, all other departments, and considerably less than the average departmental increase of over 6%. As part of the information gathering exercises, updated resource bids of £103 million pounds above the 21-22 opening baseline, which include COVID pressures, were submitted as detailed in the written briefing provided to the committee. These bids are essential to ensure the continuation of many basic public services, including the adequate provision of water and wastewater services and public transport. This draft resource outcome will be extremely challenging if further funding is not secured and very difficult decisions will be required. It will also have very significant implications for the Northern Ireland's economic recovery, driven through the programme for government. There are unknown challenges ahead in relation to the impact of COVID on the Department's public services, and the Department has not received any proposed allocations for COVID pressures as part of the draft 21-22 budgets. Although funding has been received in 2021 to support financial stability within the Department's arms like bodies, um, Translink and, 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 and then also the EVA, um, this will quickly be eroded if additional funding is not provided in future years to manage the impact of COVID. On the capital front, £693.2 million pounds has been allocated against our an estimated requirement of £888.2 million. The requirement, the requirement for next year is substantially higher than this year due to the spend profile of a number of major projects and the investment requirements for Northern Ireland Water as set out in the Utility Regulator's draft determination. £562 million is required simply to meet DFI's existing commitments without any further allocations outside these top priorities. These commitments relate to flagship and inescapable projects and those areas of business that are contractually pre-committed. The draft allocation is 135 million higher than this year's opening position. And although this significant increase in capital is extremely welcome, it will be very difficult and challenging to deliver a capital program of this scale without a corresponding increase to the resource budgets. The Minister continues to make the case for an enhanced resource budget to ensure that the delivery of vital public services um, on which citizens depend is not impeded. The fact that we're also facing a further one-year budget is also a significant challenge when planning for and delivering major capital programmes. So, in closing, I hope that this briefing has outlined the challenges that the Minister faces and the difficult financial decisions, particularly on resource that will likely have to be taken in the coming months if the draft budget allocation is not increased, and also depending on how the COVID pandemic unfolds. In closing, it's important to reiterate that the Minister is very keen to get the Committee's views and support in shaping and delivering improvements to people's everyday lives, and she welcomes your constructive challenge and, and input. 
Um, so thank you um, for uh, that opportunity to, to make some opening remarks. And Susan, John, Terry and I are very happy to take any questions that the committee may have. Okay, thank you, Linda. And, and you have said that, it, that it's disappointing and that there are real mm -hmm. challenges ahead. Um, with regards to resource, um, what case are you making with regards to that? Um, what would be um, an, an ideal um, amount, um, given the fact that allocations now ha are being made ac across all departments? And, and I do know that you're saying that um, a 0.7 increase is proportionally less than other departments um, and less than the average of over 6%. So can you maybe get, just give us a little bit more information as to what would be required and what you're asking for? Mm -hmm. Well, we're effectively asking for a further 103 million over and above um, what we've already been um, given. Now, that, that includes um, an, an estimated COVID um, uh, pressure, which I think is about 50 million of the 103. Um, so, you know, and, and that, I suppose, is, is the part that is very hard to determine at this point in time. You know, we, we keep hoping that, you know, um, the impact of, of uh, vaccination um, will start to loosen up restrictions, but we just don't know how um, the COVID situation is going to roll. Um, there was a, a report um, published recently around, um, and it was a UK-wide report, around how quickly, for example, people think that um, the public are going to start using public transport to the extent that they had done in the past, pre-COVID, and it could take several years to get back up to what is a normal level of um, passenger transport, and that will clearly impact on, on income. You know whether people are going to want to come in to, to city towns and cities and use car park car parking is another issue, um, and then um, for Northern Ireland Water, I think one of the key issues is that as more of a stay at home um, and work from home, the domestic use of water will increase, and clearly that is not an income stream for Northern Ireland Water. So um, the income that they would have got from businesses will be displaced by a further call on um, the public purse. As, as we um, in, in uh, government cover um, the domestic charges. So, you know, I think it's, it's a very challenging position, I think, in, in terms of resource. And, uh, you know, clearly the, the, the um, arguments that we're making is that this is going to impact on public service. Um, and as I said in my opening statement, I think the other point to make is that whilst the um, capital outcome is... Um, more positive, it can only be delivered if we have the sufficient staff resourcing within the department and our ALBs to deliver on that capital programme. So th there's a there's a, a very clear link between the, the two budgets. Okay, yes, yeah, so you've, you've made the point that they are inextricably linked. Um, mm -hmm. Can you maybe just, for the committee's information, maybe just um, give the case as to what the real impact of this will be and what the, the decisions that are likely to have to be made on the basis of this? Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, you know, I think it, it's it's very hard to be quite specific because, you know, the Minister is going to have to um, make decisions as to what to prioritise if we can't get um, some movement in the, um, the gap that, that we're currently facing. Um, but you know, it is likely to impact directly on, on public services. Um, I mean, John, do you want to say something about you know, a, a, a reduced resource income um, and what impact that would have on roads? So, uh, uh, can you hear me okay, yeah? Yes, we can, thank you. Um, so, ju just in, in real world terms, so the resource budget uh, in roads and rivers uh, works its way down to the day-to-day -day maintenance of you know roads and rivers uh, assets. So you know gully cleaning, street lighting outages, grass cutting, you know bridge repairs, road markings, things like that. There, um, and, and uh, uh, you, you, I think members will be aware that over the last number of years there has been a limited service uh, in those sort of areas. So, so the impact of of reduced budget directly impacts on those sort of services at, at ground level. Now, 
it still is a draft budget and that has to be determined but but that's an example of of perhaps uh what, what it would mean on the ground okay in northern Ireland water have obviously highlighted the issue around the potential of increased costs has that been taken into consideration yeah that was all taken into consideration in the bid um in the, in the budget process yes Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr Buchanan. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lisa, just a quick couple of questions re relating to your capital budget went up obviously 40%, okay, and your resource went up 0.7. Is there a normal correlation? I appreciate this is a difficult year, but is there a normal correlation mm -hmm. between that? So, for example, the big increase of the 40% was 135 million, I think it is. Is there a normal correlation between those two based if you because if you get a massive capital jump should you be getting a resource to follow up on the capital projects or what way does that work the correlation between mm -hmm. the two well i mean there, there is a practical correlation between the two clearly um but unfortunately in terms of budget allocation that correlation hasn't factored through um into the draft budget um and that is one of the key concerns that that, that we have clearly that you know if we um, are allocated this, uh, you know, a significant jump in, in capital, which you know we will require because um, you know a, a lot of the, the big schemes are hitting the point where that they're they're starting to to, to spend money. Um, but if we don't have the staff resources and, and resource budget to cover that, then it's going to be very challenging even to, to spend the capital budget. So it it'll have a, a sort of a knock-on effect. You see, if you, if I haven't obviously took the time to look back. What, what's that like in previous years, uh, Lisa, in regard to the, the resource budget as a 0.7% increase this year? What's it been like previous years? Um, Terry, could you maybe take that one? Yes, um, <clears throat> yes, no, I, I, know, I think in, in resource terms, yes. um, this is, last, year, last year was 417 million. So it's, it's a 2.8 million pound increase last year um so, so it's a fairly flat cash as we would call it um that's that's a very minimal increase in terms of uh, last year and in, in in terms of since dfi's inception um i think our our resource budget at that stage was probably running about 370 million that's back in 2016. so it's it's increased but if you, if you take the inflationary effect over the last five years it's been a very flat budget, and we have never really recovered from the reductions in budget that happened in budget 2011, 2015, when we had a reduction of between 50 and 60 million out of our budget at that stage. So the, that structural deficit has never has has only very slowly recovered. Last year, um, our budget increased 33 million from the previous year, so that that was. That was a, an improvement, and that was very, very welcome. And that went towards meeting some of the TransLink uh, deficit um, at, on a baseline basis. Still not as much as we needed, but it was a very welcome. But basically, we're we're coming from a very low base and getting to um, even sort of a flat line resource going forward. Um, so it, it's and the only the only reason we've been able to manage. Uh, the degree we've had is because inflation has been so benign, uh, and so so that that has that has helped enormously. But but uh, essentially on the resource side, it's a coming from a very low base and now crawling our way back to stasis really. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank um, you. I suppose just Sorry, just to ahead. add to that, um, you know that that structural under under resourcing means that you know every year we have to bid for what really should be um uh quite core um activities such as winter service um you know because that's really not provided for in our baseline okay and final question in regard to the capital you've obviously you've requested 882 approximately and received mm -hmm. uh, 693. So obviously you've, you're, you're 562, as you said, with flagship and it's capable and pre-committed. So mm -hmm. that differential between 562 and 693 was at 130 million roughly. What were you going to, yeah. and appreciate you then high priority, desirable, et cetera. What were you going to 
basically spend that 130 that access over the flagship and it's capable and pre-committed how are you going to determine where that 130 that you have today goes yeah well that's going to be an issue for the minister um you know she once we get the budget final um she's going to have to determine where her priorities lie um so it's probably too early to give you a list of what what will be included in that um additional amount of money Okay, thank you, and apologies, uh, Linda was calling you Lisa, but that's a different McKee. So it's, it's, oh yes, that's, that's, I'm, that's not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not as good a singer as she is, oh, I can tell you. Don't, don't, don't strike up now, we'll leave it at that. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, Linda, just in relation to um, the, um, the, the very small increase, was there a, a rationale given in your discussions between um, infrastructure and finance with regards to why it was such a small increase by comparison to the other departments? Susan, do you maybe want to take that one? Yeah, no, as, as part of our discussions with um, DOF, we have put forward all of our pressures and explain the impacts of the pressures and the consequences and why they need to be met. But in terms of the actual allocation, um, you know, they've, in the finance minister's paper, it's been allocated, attributed to NI water pressures, um, which were 15.2 million, what we put forward. Um, but in terms of anything further, um, there's, no, there's no clarity around that. It was just in relation to, obviously, whenever you're, you're very clear that the average is over 6% for other departments, and yet such a tiny increase for um, infrastructure. I was wondering whether there had been any um, sort of clarity given um, for that. Okay. No, there's been no clarity, I suppose, why it, there wasn't a, you know, an equal allocation to each department. Um, I can only assume it's been taken on you know, priorities put forward um, and considered at that level. Okay, thank you. Ms. Kimmins? Sorry, thank you, Chair. Um, no, but just a couple of questions. Just in terms of, um, and I know the Minister mentioned this yesterday in question time, in terms of the 20 mile hour zones outside schools, is there funding earmarked then for further rollout of, of that scheme? John, do you want to take that one? Uh, I, I think we might have to come back. I, I imagine that will be part of the Minister's priorities going forward. I don't actually know the answer to that, so it might be better uh, for some of the other uh, the team and network services maybe to come back of that if that's okay chair okay yeah no that's that, that's fine thank you john um, and then just i noted around five million is identified for for now water bridge just as a can you elaborate a wee bit not or are you in any position to discuss the scheme in, in any detail at this stage like what what options are being looked at for the design of the bridge or so we take that linda yes please so uh, it, it, clearly the, the minister has indicated that narrow water bridge is a priority that she wants to take forward. So uh, at official level, uh, uh, we've been, uh, as you may be aware, there was work done probably in 12 or 2012 or 13 by Louth County Council. Um, at official level, we're, we're, we've been looking at that work and been revised looking at business cases to take that forward. And that day will end up with a discussion with the minister uh, to decide on how, how the project is taken forward, so that that's kind of work in progress. Okay, no, that's fair enough, and I appreciate that because I know with the Southern Relief Road, not too, it's 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 a process. But um, and just my final question: the, the blue green infrastructure fund. I know um, there's been a, quite a lot of interest, and as I know, even just people have been asking me about it. Um, are we able to get a breakdown of what was spent this year, and and would it be used for similar projects in in this financial year ahead now, or you know, are they looking at different projects? Um, Do we know? Well, yeah, we can certainly um, maybe provide you with a breakdown. Um, I'm not sure that we have it to hand, unless Susan, I take it you don't have that level of detail in terms of what No, we, no. Um, so, so we don't have it, we can certainly provide it. We can provide that, um, and um, you know, maybe, maybe the team that's involved in, in managing the Blue Green Infrastructure Fund, um, you know, they can outline what the plans are for next year. You know, and I know it is again a, a ministerial priority, um, and something that our, our minister has put her own personal um, efforts very much into. 
Yeah, no, I think, like, I mean, even like, I see some of the stuff that's being funded, I think would help then going forward if any, you know, if there's protector ideas and things. So that would be good. Mm-hmm. But no, that, that's all my questions, Chair. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you, Mr. Muir. Um, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for the um, officials for coming along this morning virtually. I think we're all getting used to that. Um, just a, a couple of things. Um, obviously, I welcome that the money has been secured in recent times for DVA and TransLink to help bring the reserves back to a level of resilience. Um, just a question about what their level of reserves now are compared to what we were before the COVID pandemic and just sort of information in relation to that. Um, also, uh, in relation to the capital funding, there's been quite a useful table uh, that was provided in the in the papers. It was table four, and it's just given you the opening capital budgets, how they've risen over the years. Uh, one of my questions is really is around the, the capacity to deliver um, capital projects um, in light of particularly staffing resources within the department, and just to see what, what they are compared to previous years in terms of being able to deliver upon that capital funding. Okay, um, so um, if, if I maybe take um, the, the first question and then John, could you maybe take the, the second part? Um, so in, in terms of, of reserves, um, the, the most recent bids um, will replace the reserves that both DVA and TransLink had to eat into this year to, to, to keep themselves financially afloat during COVID. It will also um, return some of the reserves, or most of the reserves actually, that TransLink has had to eat into over some, in, in previous years um, because we have been underfunding them. Um, so, you know, things like concessionary fares, you know, it, it actually costs more to deliver than we have the budget to provide them with. So, you know, I'm sure you're aware that, that over the past three or four years, um, TransLink has had to deplete its, um, uh, its reserves. Um, and, you know, this is a very welcome um, way to actually replace some of that underfunding in previous years and as i've said you know I, I, it's it's very welcome but we can't be complacent either because depending on how covid um goes they will clearly need additional budget next year which we may we may not be in a position to provide yeah but can i just come back on that before we go on to the capital question mm-hmm. um, they understood there was a covid bid so there's two types of money nowadays yeah. <laughs> and there was a COVID bid uh, for, for various things from the department, and none of those were met. Uh, within the, 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 you know, a certain amount of COVID money still left over for the next yeah. year, but it hasn't been allocated. But thus far, nothing's been met. And thus that, far. That, yeah, that was, was there a £50 million pounds bid from TransLink for next year? Yes, there was. Um, I mean, that's the best estimate of um, how much lost income there will be next year. It is an estimate. Um, and you're quite right, you know, there is this £100 million um, unallocated at the centre and, you know, our hope is that actually we will be allocated some of that, some, some of those monies um, yeah. before the, the budget's finalised. Yeah. And can I ask the implication if you didn't get those additional monies allocated for next year, uh, even in light of the, bringing the reserves back to their level which they should have been? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I suppose, again, that depends on um, the reality of um, how quickly people return to, to using public transport. Mm. Um, so, you know, it's something that we're going to have to just keep very closely monitored. And clearly, if there's um, evidence that Transic is going to hit financial difficulties again and, and, and lost income, we're going to have to start bidding monitoring rounds. Yes. Um, and bidding very hard. Yeah. Yeah, and um, just in terms of the money at the moment, obviously you know there's, there's a significant amount of money that still remains unallocated for the end of the financial year. Has the department given any consideration to any further bids from that fund? Because it would be would be really, really awful to see that surrendered back to Treasury. Yeah, I mean, we, we have gone back out again just to, to double check that there is no stone unturned and that there's nothing that we can justify bidding for at this time. Um, of the year. Uh, Susan, do you want to say anything further on that? Are you mute? She's on mute. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. To repeat myself. Um, yeah, just to reiterate, I suppose we have done everything that we can, so that's why we put forward the additional TransLink bid um, and the additional DVA bid. 
So we had revisited everything after the January monitoring round submission. And at this stage, there's really very limited opportunities to bid for anything further. And we're still trying to investigate anything that we can. Thank you. Okay. And just for John, about the resources to deliver the capital projects. So um, there's probably two ways of looking at this. So uh, we would deliver capital projects either through our in-house teams uh, or uh, through in-house teams with consultancy support. So where the resource pressure hits, if, 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 you, if you haven't got enough staff, uh, then you can't deliver the smaller, the smaller schemes. Now, I, I, and actually, there's probably a disproportionate amount of time for the smaller schemes. Smaller schemes take consume more resource. They're, they're quite, they, they might, might, uh, uh, the capital expenditure on the ground for the, 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 the resource input is disproportionate. So there's, there's two ways we deal with that. Uh, we either get more resource for more people or we can capitalize uh, so, so we can draw down some of the capital expenditure uh, into staff resource to deliver that. So that's kind of the schemes, the local transport and safety measures, probably the blue green infrastructure, the 20 miles per hour, that kind of stuff. But when you get up to the bigger schemes, then we, we um, use consulting engineers. Um, uh, well, they have the expertise and much of anything, but they have got, you know, they can bring in resources uh, uh, to help us deliver the big, big schemes. Um, uh, we rely on that when you get into the major projects. In between then, uh, we, we've got a, a, a consultancy partner uh, who we, we can draw down on resources on to assist uh, with the staff teams in delivering at, at capital projects. So th there, is a, there is a way through this uh, uh, if we can capitalise, but where we can't capitalise then that's where the resource pressure kicks in and if we don't have enough staff that's, that's, that's where the, the pressure comes. Yeah, it's same in relation to the, the voluntary exit scheme that you had a couple of years ago. Are you still living with the effects of that? Yeah, so um, probably, uh, you know, certainly in roads, at, at the time, there, there maybe uh, it could have been between two or three hundred people uh, uh, left at that stage. So uh, clearly we had to slim down what we did uh, and we probably still deliver uh, uh, you, you know, in terms of value uh, or more of what we delivered them with the less staff, so it's more for less. So, look, mm. it, it's you know we, we we work our way through this here. There there are certainly pressures and resources, no doubt about that. Linda said that, mm -hmm. uh, and we try and work our way through this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, lastly, because I'm conscious other members have got questions. See, in terms of that resource pressure, would that have had any bearing on just in terms of the the need to get spend and roads maintenance because. Obviously, you've got your projects, and they're very tangible and very much needed. But also, roads maintenance is something that is a day-to-day -day thing that people will raise. So that's something that's impacting upon the, the ability to be able to invest in that area. So, okay, it creates a pressure. So you need capacity to deliver. Uh, um, if there's a pressure on your resources, then you reduce your capacity. There's no doubt that that's 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 in the background. But I think. Uh, it's fair to say that you know we, we still deliver in terms of road maintenance at, at a very high level. And I was looking at the numbers there for um, uh, structure maintenance as, as approaching it's like something like ninety five or ninety six million this year. So that's very significant. You know that's a couple of million a week if you if you look at it that way. So we still spend very significant amounts of money. But that's not to underestimate that you know people work very hard and there are pressures behind the scenes. Yeah, and I think just maybe to add on that, I, I think you know the the, the um, lack of resource is probably one reason why we haven't been able to use a lot more maintenance budget at the end of the financial year because you know there is that lack of flexibility because of the reduction in, in staff numbers on the, on the roads maintenance side of the, the business. Yeah, I think it's something we need to be conscious of, and that's how the resource and capital is interacting mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. as well. And, I think it's maybe something to follow up in, in due course, but thank you very much. It's appreciated. Okay, thank you, Mr. Beggs. Hello, uh, again, thanks for the, the background information. Certainly, you have a lot of difficulties with, with the budget, I, I can see that. Um, but just to follow on a little bit of what you've said in terms of the difficulties that um, the resource budget is having on your capital spend, 
can I advise, can I ask why, why, why do you not automatically build in the resource requirement to a capital project and then you actually get its true costs and when it arrives, uh, there is a funding there to, to deliver it? Um, well, I suppose in, in terms of, of um, budgeting, you know, the resource budget and the capital budget are two separate bids. So we clearly have bid for both the capital that we need and the level of resource that we feel we need to deliver that capital. Um, but unfortunately, in, in terms of the allocation, there's this mismatch. So you know we've done quite well actually on the, on the capital side, of, or certainly better. Um, but we haven't done well on the resource at all. We, as John said, in some cases we can capitalise um, the uh, resource that's required, but not in all cases. Um, so there is still this mismatch, but but it's not because we haven't budgeted for it. You, but you said you can capitalise. Can you can you advise what stops you capitalising? Because uh, if you're actually going to get the true cost of a project, it should also cost uh, should cover the admin uh, associated from the department. Yeah, John, do you want to make more comment on that? Yeah, well, I, I, just one point to make: if you capitalise everything, you reduce your capital spending power. So it's better to have the resources on the resource side. The budget comes in, in two lines, and um, so that there, there's a balance. Here, I think so. What you know, within the major projects, all all the kind of consult consulting engineers would be capitalised. The issue comes down to the, the schemes that are delivered by our in-house teams, uh, and and ideally, uh, you know, they, they would be resourced up, and you wouldn't have to capitalise. So that would give you more capital spending power to deliver stuff on the ground. Yeah. There are also set rules about how and when you can capitalise. I don't know, Susan or Terry, do you want to, to talk a bit about that? No, I suppose that's just the other point to make, that we do have to follow the government accounting rules, so we can't um, capitalise any sort of, of the pre-works that are carried out that don't directly attribute to the asset development, so we're very clear on what we can and can't capitalise, and that's what we'll be audited on at year end as well, so I think we're, we're quite focused on that. In, in terms of the, the difficult decisions that, that, that you face, um, there, there are different headings in, in the background information you've given us. Um, some projects strike me as being absolutely uh, essential. Uh, critical railway safety sounds as if mm -hmm. light is endangered if that it doesn't, is not completed. Um, but there are other projects where, where perhaps the, the scheduling of the project uh, may enable um, yeah, you to take choices and live within your budget or, or to avoid those projects that are not absolutely essential. So can, can you live within your budget by rescheduling? I think it's certainly something that we need to, to look at. I mean, you're quite right on rail safety. I think that's, you know, that's inescapable in my head. You know, you can't mess with rail safety. Um, and I, you know, I think the minister is also very conscious of that. Um, Re-profiling re the spend might go some way to meet, meet um, budget shortfalls, but I don't think it's going to um, uh, close the, the gap um, at all. Um, you know, so so I think that's where you know there's going to have to be a, a very serious uh, consideration given to, to what we um, can and should prioritise, and that will be for the minister. Uh, again, you haven't asked my question, answered my question about the scheduling, particularly of larger projects. Because if you instead of doing a large project over one or one year, you do it over two years, that, that creates options for you. So, it, it, it's the nature of the contracts uh, that does it enable you to uh, um, do a degree of rescheduling to in order to in your budget if additional monies are not available. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, certainly on the capital side, I think you know that that is one way to look at it. Um, and you know, capital projects by their very nature can um, also experience um, delays um, through external things that are outside our control. So you know, on the on the capital front, you know, I think the way to live within the budget, given that we do have a shortfall there, is to just make sure that we we look at the scheduling and prioritise what needs to go first. I think, I think my um, previous remarks were really about the resource budget, which is where are we, we have a significant concern. Um, and that will be harder, I think, to manage through you know, reprofiling or, or, or rescheduling, because 
so much of what we require on the resource budget is, is really inescapable and, and is needed to to uh, run the department and the CLBs. Can you can you give a detailed picture of actually what will happen if the resource budget uh, does not uh, improve? Uh, I mean, I do understand there has been uh, huge resource pressures within the department, as you said earlier, uh, going back over five years um, and having to survive within your monitoring. So, um, what is the impact of your starting budget if, if uh, additional resources are not provided? Well, it will impact on our ability to deliver essential public services. Um, now, I can't tell you, you know, in terms of, of how it's going to impact on Translink or Northern Water or roads maintenance, because, you know, that that impact will dis, will de, will be determined by the final decisions made on how the budget is then allocated. Um, but you know, you you can um, work through yourself. You know, if if either Northern Ireland Water or Translink or you know our own core teams don't get the resources that they need, there's going to be an impact on public services, you know, a degradation of public services, and, and that's really all I can say today on that matter. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay thank you. Um, Ms Anderson? Um, thank you, Linda, and, and thank you your or your team and um, for for informing us today and, and for coming forward with the information prior to that. Uh, there's a couple of issues, Linda, that I would like more um, information on. Um, I don't know if you would have it there, but maybe you could bring it to the committee if not. I'm very much aware, Linda, as I know you are, that last year the, your department um, got the biggest budget ever. Now, I'm conscious of the pressures that you have outlined. Mm -hmm. uh, last year, you got a re uh, resource increase of 9%. Now, we all know, we've heard and listened to the finance minister um, explain the difficulties with the standstill budget that he has received. So um, I'm sort of pleased in that context to hear that at least you've got a 40% uplift, uplift in capital, although I'm very mindful of the implications of what you said about resources. Now, because we don't have the economic levers of power, and the cost of partition is something in this committee. Uh, we don't want to go there, um, but um, I'll not drag you into identifying the elephant in the room. So when we're talking about the capital requirements for next year, there's a couple of things I would like explained. In the information that you provided, you noted, um, I believe it was EU 55.7 million uh, is being replaced for the Connecting European Facility Fund. Now, I wasn't sure because of where it was allocated in the paper, the way it was laid out. Is that um, a commitment that you have received? Have you got that funding replaced? So could you elaborate on that as to where that funding is coming from? Um, no, so it, 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 there, there is, under NDNA, there is um, 25 million committed for low emission buses. Um, and that's, I suppose, in addition to the bids that we've formally made through um, the budgeting process. Um, in, in terms of the Connecting Europe Fund, I mean, that's where we are um, lobbying through the um, through TEO to get um, some of that replaced through the Shared Prosperity Fund. Um, now, I think there was, there was due to be some outline of how that would work um, in the coming weeks, but I, I believe it's been delayed and we may not know much about that until maybe around March. Um, so, you know, we are continuing to explore other avenues to, to increase the departmental budget and you meet the shortfalls from some of these um, other, other funds. The, the other fund that we're clearly um, working very hard on is Peace Plus. Um, and, uh, you know, we're hopeful that there will be both funding for um, transport and some water related environmental projects through Peace Plus. Um, so you know, we are working through the, the, the procedures with um, DOF and, and SCUPB on, on that one as well. Unfortunately, Linda, I think it's yourselves and every other department is hoping that uh, this piece plus funding is going to grow um, uh, way beyond what's actually going to be in the budget because the money that you've lost, the 55.7 million that you talk about, is that in total the funding that you received from the EU or is that just in that connecting European facility? And if it is only the connecting European 
facility, uh, what is your total budget loss from the EU as a result of Brexit? Um, so I think, Terry, the, the, it is just the Connecting Europe fund, isn't it? That 55 million. I think the that 55 million is made up of a couple of different funds. So that's, it, that represents the, the amount we'd be expecting towards those EU funded programs. And that is not included in the current budget allocation. So we're waiting for that to come um, as part of a, a separate budget settlement. Okay, so that's your hoping in the shared prosperity fund that every other department is hoping as we were told that not the funding was going to be replaced. But Linda, um, you'll remember that the finance minister has said in his discussions with the Treasury that they've been quite clear that the shared prosperity fund is not going to be allocated as we were promised, and they want to, what they are calling now, level up, which is really allocate more to England than here. So um, it's just to understand from your department what kind of contingency plans are going to be put in place given that the finance minister is not going to be receiving the kind of budget as promised when we were dragged out of the EU and the implications that that would have for your department in the event of that budget not being allocated from elsewhere because we know that every department, we know the Department of the Economy is mm -hmm. down to 70, 80 million. We know every other department is talking in hundreds of millions now in an accumulated figure of nearly um, 3.5 billion over a new crunch. So how yeah. is going to manage that? Well, I suppose there's only really two choices and, and both of them are going to be difficult. So, you know, one is bid for additional monies through the block, but we, we already know the pressure that that's under. And the other um, option is, is simply to figure out how we can live within the budget that we have, but that will mean not doing things. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, I mean, we are clearly trying to drive through efficiencies as well, um, both within, you know, the department and how it operates and within our ALBs and, you know, TransLink um, announced um, efficiencies that they were able to drive through last year. Northern Water has um, stripped out something like 60 million of, 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 from its operating budget um, over, uh, you know, an eight to 10 year period, which you know, when you consider it, it's delivering more um, more water and wastewater services to more people and customers at, 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 and to better standards, you know, that's commendable. Um, and I know in, in the next price control, um, you know, that the regulator is also uh, determining that, that Northern Water needs to drive through further efficiencies, but those are going to be challenging because all of the very obvious things have been done and you do need to actually invest to make those long-term savings. Um, so, you know, we're not less resting on our laurels, um, but, but, you know, that will just add to our difficulties if, if actually, um, you know, the, the monies that we have traditionally got. Um, okay, the yeah. impact, the, can I ask you, it's the impact that I was looking at it not doing things, maybe changes to policy and service delivery, and you've outlined some of that today, and as a public body, you must comply with your statutory equality duty and apply exactly. schemes. So it's just to, uh, I think as a committee, we need to know um, what kind of consideration has been given to how they, you know, you, it's not just that you look at your department and how uh, not only that the function of the settlement in terms of the budgetary settlement is having on the operation, but how it's going to have on the changes of policy. So have you looked at the likely impact when you're talking about you have to look at planning ahead and yeah. what has in the quality impact assessment when or if you haven't done so already uh will you be starting a section 75 equality impact uh, assessment because those assessments and the impact of all of those need to precede the decision yeah. and inform uh, yeah. the assessments that you take before you make a decision before your minister makes a decision so where is all that at yeah, so we have um, clearly started that process um, and we're actually in the process of drafting um, an equality impact assessment um, to go online to be made public. And like, by its very nature and at this point in the budgeting process, it's going to be fairly high level, but it, it will outline you know, the impacts of, you know, if, 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 um, if we have to make cuts in certain areas, what impact that is going to have. Um, so we're, we're working through that at the moment. 
Well, I think as a committee, we would like to be across that, um, particularly the high level nature of it. I know that is necessary in one respect, but I have concerns that I see a pattern developing across departments that these EQIAs are all high level. And therefore, it's hard for people to get the information as to what the actual impact is going to have, what's going to be the change to the policy, what's going to be the change to the service delivery before it hits the ground. And so we just need to keep an eye on that. Can I ask you just in relation to one other question around the funding that has been allocated to phase three of the Derry Coleraine Works? Uh, if you could elaborate on that, please. Um, well, uh, you know, the, the minister has committed to that to that work going ahead, um, and uh, you know she has asked for that to be delivered as quickly as possible. So, again, you know that will be one of the minister's key priorities in this. Um, so, you know, I, I think that that will feature in, in next year's budgets um, as as a ministerial priority. Do you see in relation to, I'll come back to that one then, in relation to bids for the remaining financial year, and I've listened to the finance minister call on his ministerial colleagues to come forward with bids, um, are you exploring ways to maximise bids? For instance, I noted that uh, councils like Derry and Japan Council and other councils are getting hit very hard due to COVID, and you've mentioned some of the, your own pressures yourselves. Mm -hmm. So could the department not increase maybe its contribution towards maybe the Greenway scheme? We know that the lion's share of that all came from Interreg and, and Europe. Uh, I'm looking at what other colleagues have talked about, road safety grants and issues like that. So are there opportunities? We know that we're all very keen to have another taxi scheme or the scheme that is being developed and enhanced the taxi drivers are looking at others, rightly so, when the kind of things have been in place compared to what they receive. So what's your plans to try to go forward in the short term uh, to maximise yeah. bid? Well, I mean, as we said, I think you know, given that we've now less than two months to spend, I, I think it would be a real challenge to you know, develop and deliver something radically new. Um, you know, under the um, Blue Green Infrastructure Fund, you know, we've already given councils um, monies to spend on blue green um, uh, projects, and you know we're looking to, to work with councils to actually maximise the spend in, in that area as well. Um, we continue to, to to try to think: is there anything else that we could do towards the end of this financial year? But you know, I think we've we've probably, as Susan has said, you know the, the opportunities are limited at this point in the year. Okay, thank you, Linda. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, and Mr. Boylan. Hello, Chair Yeah. Yes. Hello. Yeah. Right. Linda, thanks very much, you and the team. Mm -hmm. Just want to go back to the Translink. Obviously, Translink that got the thirty-five million. You identified seven million pressures. Is that within the new fifteen million? Those seven million pressures, and I take it that's fifty million altogether. So, the question is. Um, where exactly is the pressures in, in TransLink? I know you mentioned the concerts be fair and the reserves, but can you give us a wee bit more detail in relation yeah. to all of it? So I suppose in, in terms of the 2021 20, baseline um, allocation, that was 7 million below what they felt they needed to operate. And then you've got all of the, the additional COVID pressures. So as I said, the 50 million is really... Um, uh, money that we could justify providing to them now to um, bring the reserves back up to the level that they were at before this year one year underfunding um, uh, started. So, um, you know, the, the 50 million is there and, and it would be a very useful financial buffer for them. Um, but as I said, there is still a, a basic underfunding in terms of, of, of what they need as a baseline. How um, much? Can you give us a figure on that? Susan, do you do you want to to talk in a bit more detail about this? Yeah, I suppose I suppose the actual baseline under funding is the seven million. So that's um, what we've included as a pressure to bring up to what TransLink would need. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Just I'm just following on. I mean, obviously you've topped up the DVR reserves. Um, mm -hmm. is is there a percentage that they have to hold or need to be at, or is it? Are you going to bid for any additional reserves for them? Um, well, I think we felt that was the maximum that we could justify okay. bidding for. Um, you know, they were holding reserves actually to um, fund their capital programme, you know, the replacement of MOT centres. 
And you know, we, we were concerned that if we weren't able to replace those reserves, that actually that capital program would get pushed out even further. Um, so you know, we were very um, grateful that we were provided with the money to, to, to build up those reserves again, um, because it means that that capital program can, can go ahead as planned. Um, there are bids for the year. Do you intend to meet that bid, the full bid that the NAW for the year? No, we're waiting on the PC21. But yeah, we are. And, yeah, and in, in terms of the, the final determination, that's now not going to be published until mid May. Okay. Um, but we um, have based um, our, our uh, budget ask on the draft determination because that's the latest best figure that we have. I mean, we continue to work with, with Northern Ireland Water and with the regulator um, to ensure that any figures that we're putting forward are the latest best estimates. Um, but, you know, that the, the determination is really the contract between the regulator and Northern Ireland Water about the, the amount of money it needs to spend to deliver a level of service that would justify the tariffs. So if we can't provide that money, you know, Northern Ireland Water are then in a position where they can't deliver the level of service. And actually, if that continues, then the, um, the tariff that the regulator says um, Northern Ireland Water can, uh, can levy on, on, on its customers will decrease and their income will go down even further and you'll get into this downward spiral. So, you know, we believe that, that, that the, um, you know, as the uh, shareholder for Northern Water, um, and and its funder that we are required to make the determination um, that the regulator puts forward. Sound and I mean obviously you try and work with them in the interim period to that PC is announced. Abs absolutely. So if, if if there's any sort of change um, in in the background that that, that you know, we know about it, um, and we can factor that into our latest bids. We can't resist a meeting without having a wee chat with John as well in terms of rural road maintenance. Because John, I mean, following, Linda, following on from the last meeting, I obviously I've been talking to some contractors and I've said this before, we have good working relationships with the AFA officials, especially those guys on the ground we meet on a regular basis. And I mean, you know, or, or, no matter what anybody says about capital works or anything, those things are in plan. But I mean, rural maintenance, rural maintenance is a big issue for us. And I mean, you know, there's no doubt that councillors and ourselves are inundated potholes and bad sets of roads, especially in the wintertime. John, you're you're very familiar with this. And I mean, what, what I'm saying, we need to try and get money down on the ground. I mean, if if we as a committee hadn't known there was a capacity issue in terms of delivery, we certainly would have supported the department, I'm sure. But I can say from our, my own party's point of view, would have supported those, those efforts of the department to try and address those capacity issues, you know? I know it's difficult with COVID and everything else, but where possible, I mean, people are not just pointing at a pothole and complaining for the sake of it, according to some reports in the chamber this week. The issue is that there's serious issues out there on the roads in terms of potholes. It does happen, especially over the winter period. There is a deterioration, and that's not the legacy issues, the, the investment for years, but all I'm saying, we need to try and get as much money as we can down onto the ground. And I mean, just, you know that, and we, we'd be fully supportive of it, but. If there's any issues there, we, we, we need to know up front as a committee and try and work with you in terms of trying to address those. So just maybe to, to take back to Terry's point about going back to 2011, I think he said, and, and, and uh, where these problems probably all, all arose. But back about that time, probably in terms of, I'm only talking about roads, not roads and rivers, uh, for roads maintenance, the, the, the kind of baseline budget for the, the normal service would have been there maybe around 50 million. Uh, and that's for, I said, grass cutting, potholes, gully emptying, street, light repair, street lighting repairs. Uh, you know, the, the opening baseline for this year was 27 and a half. So you, you can see the difference. So that manifests itself on the ground uh, with being able to, uh, it's more of a limited service rather than the, than the full service. Um, a limited service then means you have to prioritize your resources um, and what that means is, you, you, you for example, uh, on potholes, you, you target your resources at the highest traffic roads first. So, as you rightly point out, then you know that leads then to issues when you work your way down the network. So, so the issues that you're highlighting, uh, I suppose, directly relate to the amount of 
uh, resource that the department has to deliver, as Linda says, public facing services? No, no I, I appreciate that, but at some point, you know, we can't let it continue on, you know what I mean? I, I understand we need this debate, but we need we need to strategically look at it differently yeah. or stuff like yeah. to see yeah. how we how we're gonna address that, you know, in the future. So the minister and the department have to prioritize uh, the delivery of, of those types of services within the budgets that, 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 that they get. Uh, uh, so so uh, you, you know you, you have to live within your means uh, and that's why. So th this year has been a bit better than previous years, but uh, we're at draft budget stage and looking forward, as Linda says, if there's a, a resource pressure here, there's a potential for that to manifest itself in the areas that you, you've mentioned. Now it is only draft at this stage, and, uh, but you know, uh, hopefully, you know, I've explained that you know why, uh, what the what the real world impacts, as we talked about earlier, potentially are. Well, well John, I, I'll say I'll leave it at this because I mean I know Linda was talking about 131 million, and the minister going to make a decision on house priorities, but I mean there's money there, and I mean the committee would support any bids if we can be creative in terms of COVID or whatever it is. We would certainly support bids bids to to. To try and you know address some of the issues, you know. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, um, Ms. Kelly. Thanks, Chair, and uh, thanks very much for the presentation. I have to say, it's a very depressing outlook uh, in relation to infrastructure, and it's quite appalling to learn that. Uh, I think you said at the outset, uh, and I can't understand the reason why. Uh, that the infrastructure department has received proportionally less than any other department. Uh, given that, uh, I think nearly ever, nearly ever, every other country trying to plan for coming out of COVID recovery uh, uh, recognises the importance of uh, investment in infrastructure and in driving the economy forward, providing opportunities. So I think there's a lot of work. Uh, for us all to do in trying to uh, get some improvement and from listening to my colleagues on the uh, committee it's quite clear uh, that from the pothole down the road uh, to the street light to the big capital projects at Brossing of the one hem sheet and so far as seeking additional uh, funding and supporting the minister in any bids that you may put forward but uh, can I ask in relation to uh, the city deals uh, you know I see if somebody set aside uh, for those but Given that, I don't think the Secretary of State has made any announcement yet. What are the implications going forward for city deals if the British government doesn't honour its commitments, which, to be honest, isn't unheard of? <laughs> well, yes, I mean, we, we clearly have a, a, an important role to play in delivering on the city deals, um, but they are dependent on funding. And um, John, you've maybe been more directly involved in some of the discussions on city deals than I have. Do you want to maybe say this more? There, there are three city deals at various stages at the moment. There's the Belfast Region City Deal, uh, which is uh, moving towards the, the site signing of the deal, maybe you know, in the near future. There's Derry City and Straban, which is uh, getting towards heads of terms. And there's Mid and South West, which is kind of kicking off the process. So, um, you know, city deals, uh, the makeup of city deals is essentially the government provides. Uh, a, a level of funding, and then the executive has agreed to match fund that. So you get a pot of funding to deliver a range of projects across infrastructure, tourism, tourism regeneration, uh, digital, etc. So, so the, these are deals. They, they are actually, you know, you have to look at these. I think in a more long term basis. Uh, uh, so these would be uh, oh, perhaps money will flow over the next uh, ten years or so, uh, um, but. Until deals are signed, then money money doesn't flow. So we're probably uh, you know at, at, at the early stages uh, in terms of the budgetary process and, and how it will all pan out. Um, if I mean um, if there's an announcement, um, uh, how ready is the department and indeed the councils you know that are impacted because it is a partnership. Um, a project, if you like, um, and a commitment, obviously, under NDNA. Um, so am I then understanding that the department is doing the preparatory work in partnership with, with uh, your colleagues across other agencies? And should announcement come, um, you'll be able to quickly uh, develop um, uh, with whatever funding lies ahead of you? So, 
So the, 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 the councils are very much in the lead. So we all are partners. Um, mm -hmm. The department is, is a player, but not the main player. So for example, in Belfast, there are 22 projects being considered at the minute. The department has three. Okay. And there is that in Strabane, uh, we're probably the departments in the lead in one and mid and south west is in the early early stages but so we're we're, we're a partner um take we're taking projects forward and you know to get them ready to go uh, as soon as well when deals are signed um uh, in line with how uh, uh the city deal partners would prioritize their scheme so if you imagine there's going to be a funding envelope over a period of time and the schemes will have to fit in but it's up to the city deal partners to determine uh, uh, their their priorities and then how funding will flow after that. So Belfast is very much in the lead. The others are, you know, uh, it, it's the same process, but uh, they're they're uh, a bit behind. Okay, uh, John. I think uh, we're well used to hearing the phrase "shovel ready" projects within the Department of Infrastructure, in particular around NIW and indeed roads maintenance. And I have to concur with uh, Cahill in relation to rural areas. Uh, they're in a pretty poor state. So, um, and what I had heard over the last couple of years, um, and it was also whenever the assembly, of course, was suspended, that many contractors went across to GB or over the boat up to the south to do a lot of work. So whenever money did become available, you know, there wasn't always uh, the contractors and the workforce here. I, I, is that still a problem? So there's, there's no doubt some of the, the, the big contractors have, uh, have uh, taken up opportunities across the water mm -hmm. uh, and potentially that takes skills across the water. But, uh, you know, I, I don't necessarily, you know, it's not, not something I've picked up. Uh, maybe a question that I heard earlier that the CEF are, are coming to your committee or maybe going to be invited might be one to ask them but mm -hmm. no, I, I think we certainly have the capacity in the industry uh, to, to deliver the, the so there's, there's a split here there's the, the major capital projects and then there's the, the, the kind of maintenance type projects and structural maintenance there's certainly that would not definitely apply to the, the structural maintenance end of things on the major capital you know uh, mm -hmm. I, 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 I don't think it potentially as an issue, it might be one to ask the CEF, but I, I don't know if I see that as a problem. And, you know, if you look at the, the A6 at the minute, so, uh, you know, there's an example of uh, uh, local companies delivering big schemes. Um, uh, you know, they're delivering mammoths, mammoth amounts of uh, uh, money. I, like, I was, I've got some figures there, it's something like 1.7 million a week at the minute on the, the two A6 projects. So, so the capacity, you know, is there. So it's a legit, I think it's a legitimate question to ask. Uh, uh, it might be one worth following up with CEF. Thanks for that, John. And if I could just go uh, then to the funding of NIW, because I do know uh, that the executive is committed to meeting the waiting list within social and affordable housing, in particular social housing. And I know, uh, of course, uh, the, the, the difficulties that there are in terms of the capacity within NIW to assist. So uh, in terms of the ambition, if you like, of the Department of Communities and the executive more generally uh, around social housing, um, it has that um, um, requirement that will need uh, for investment NIW been met within this proposed budget, uh, you know, uh, to allow uh, the Department of Communities and the Executive to meet their objectives. And um, sorry. sorry, Linda, you're turned off. Uh. <laughs> sorry. So yeah, um, the draft determination budget. Um, you know, it is saying um, that uh, Northern Water is going to need a significant hike over the next six years um, to meet its, its um, licence obligations and its statutory obligations. Um, that, though, won't um, resolve all of the capacity issues, and um, both the regulator and Northern Water have been quite clear about that. So, you know, there's over 100 areas, as I'm sure you're aware, where there are um, development constraints. Mm -hmm. If they get their full uh, capital budget for the next six years, um, and that will be a challenge because, you know, it's starting high next year, but it's growing from there on in. Um, that will resolve, I think it's around 49 of those areas. Um, it'll take 12 years, two full price controls to actually, um, you know, I, I suppose, fully address and tackle the historic underinvestment and get our wastewater infrastructure up to a level where 
you know, that there is no development strength in Northern Ireland, and and that's just the way it is. Um, you know, it's that level of investment that's required. Um, well, it's very worrying. But can I ask then? We've heard to the British Prime Minister on more than one occasion talking about turbocharging and investment. You know, to get the economy going again. I, I, um, apologies if I have, um, have missed this on the news or whatever, but has there been any uh, additional uh, Barnet consequentials uh, as a result of those commitments from the British government coming across? Has it yet come across to Northern Ireland? And if it has, has it gone into infrastructure? Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, I, I think it's it's all part of the shared prosperity fund and you know all of that. Um, and you know there are commitments in the NA, and I know that that we continue to press um, the UK government um, about how they're going to fulfil those commitments. Uh, I suppose one element that that they have provided funding for is the low uh, zero emission buses. Uh, that was an NDA NA commitment, and that money is being provided. Okay. Uh, that's Five million. Well, I think there, there's more questions, I think, around the Shared pr Prosperity Fund. But, uh, Chair, I think uh, I, I would be fairly safe to say that uh, from what we're being presented with today, that uh, the Infrastructure Department is living very much hand-to-mouth, it would appear. And actually, just to follow on from your question to John about um, you know, displacement of um, uh, resources down south, uh, there is a specific issue that Northern Ireland Water is reporting on... Um, water engineers um, mm -hmm. because Irish Water have a very significant investment program and they have said that you know the impact of that is that um, those specialised contractors are getting a lot of work um, and therefore it's putting the, the, the cost of tenders up you know, so, so it's creating a bit of inflation um, over and above normal inflation and that's very specific specialised area of work. Well, uh, Chair, I just think that's an interesting uh, one that we might want to refer to the economy minister's department, to the department, or committee rather, uh, given you know the, um, that many young people, um, in particular, and, and people who have maybe lost their jobs are looking to you know to retrain. Uh, it is something that maybe uh, if there is a niche market uh, for investment in terms of apprenticeships or or, is, or training, that's something that I'm sure the economy committee might be interested in. But thank you very much, Linda. Thank you, Chair. Hey, thank you. Um, thank you, Linda. Obviously disappointed that there are no new um, innovative bids for, for projects or, or schemes um, with regards to, to COVID. And, and what I absolutely appreciate um, the time scales that were presented by um, by finance mm -hmm. in relation to that. Uh, that's probably something that the, the finance minister is going to have to, to answer for. But um, just with regards to if there is any um, flexibility with regards to that funding, um, is the department looking at any schemes? Um, because I, I appreciate what you've said around there's only six weeks to deliver a scheme, but in the event yeah. that there is flexibility um, going into the next budget, um, are you working up anything in particular? Well, um, you know, I think you, you had a presentation about the uh, support schemes, the COVID support schemes, and you know that there is a second bus scheme that I think is you know is being worked on. Um, but but over and above that, I mean, that's really I think all we have the capacity to do between now and the end of the year. Um, you know, there's two two taxi schemes, two bus schemes. Um, and uh, that is what my colleagues on that side of the, the, the um, department are, are concentrating on um, to, to get those delivered. Um, and you know, with no additional resource um, provided to the department to do that, um, you know, that in itself is, has been a challenge to get those four schemes up, running and delivered in the time frame. Okay, well, and obviously, and, and I do appreciate that. Um, but obviously, we, we've we've had a broader conversation in relation to um, some of the challenges about perhaps not being able to deliver on some new schemes. And I was wondering whether or not there had been any consideration being given to sort of maybe even reprofiling um, um, possible um, schemes uh, into COVID. Um, what, what, sorry, what types of schemes? Um, well, particularly some of the issues that we've been talking around, sort of greenways and so on too, which maybe would have right. been regarded as um, yeah. sort of additional yeah. um, types of schemes. Yeah, well, again, you know, the Blue Green Infrastructure Fund, um, you know, they're concentrating on um, delivering the, on the commitments and the funding that's already there. And I think that's 
again, as much as um, that team feels it can deliver in the time frame it's, it's been given. We'll, we'll, we'll return to all of this again at, at, in future meetings. So, um, thank okay. you, Linda uh, and the team, for presenting to us this morning. Okay. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thanks, Noe. Okay, members. Everyone's disappeared now. Okay, Mr. Beggs, are you speaking, or I can't hear you? Yeah, I had my hand raised there. It was just my reflection on um, what, what we've heard there. Um, I think there is a real issue uh, of resource capacity and the ability to uh, make projects uh, shovel ready and then to deliver them. Now, the vaccine, we were hearing just reports recently of vaccine updates and it's having a very successful impact in lowering transmissions. It looks as if daylight could be coming, and uh, it is correct that um, there's likely to be investment in infrastructure, I understand, uh, going forward um, once the economy opens up again uh, to try and encourage things. Uh, and if, if we are not um, in a position uh, to present such shovel-ready projects and indeed to uh, manage them, uh, we will not be able to facilitate that. So that's that's something which is a committee we should be pressing on um, with the department uh, and supporting uh, additional resources. Okay, thank you. Content with that. Yes, um, Ms. Anderson. Uh, yeah, Chair, sorry, you probably didn't uh, realise I had my hand up just to support more or less what you were saying in relation to the new schemes. I'm thinking very much of the new green scheme that we've talked about of the possibility of trying to get that extended, particularly when the department is doing it. I know that Stratfoil and Derry, uh, for instance, is one, and I'm sure all our members could, could talk about other areas in their own constituencies um, that could certainly um, uh, use that money and take it forward within the next two months uh, to, to kick start. Well, the project has been 50% funded and to get it 100% funded, given that the funding is there, um, as opposed to maybe looking at other departments or councils to do that. But Chair, I would just like, the Minister mentioned yesterday that the department has learned from one scheme to another, and that's good, because we know that the first scheme for the taxi drivers was uh, was a bit of a mess, and then there was some learning for the second one, although we still have concerns in relation to some of the drivers being excluded. I'm looking to maybe get some information on what, you were, what she told you there in relation to the bus scheme to make sure the coach operators are included. We talked about this last week, and we know that there are a number of coach operators, for instance, Phil Dunn in Derry, and, and again, others could mention uh, similar small operators who have spent thousands in getting consultancy firms to present their bids, uh, their application grants, and yet they were still refused, even though they met the criteria. So I'm hoping that when, could we get some information, uh, if those that had been excluded because the criteria was, uh, was too rigid, once they started to go through it, uh, that the small coach operators will be included in the bus scheme that she referred to. Maybe she meant to reference coach as well and didn't, but I would just like to, uh, to put that on the record. Okay, members are content with that too. Um, Cahill Boylan. Yeah, thanks, Chair. No, Chair, I was just thinking about the um, the COVID monies. And I mean, obviously, the taxes and all, all the issues were raised before and retainers just have to But I'm wondering if there's any other way of being creative, like the, the green blue issues where we can, for mental health, you know, reasons, can the, can the department look at trying to acquire monies for other schemes? You know what I mean? Is, is there any way we can ask is, you know, you know, what exactly is the criteria for drawing down the COVID funds all in supporting business? Because I think there's an opportunity there, maybe to bid for money that we could spend. So Okay, well we can follow that up. Obviously that that's what we asked I asked just at the end there and I know that um, Martina had asked um during her questions around that. And I suppose the issue for um, the department is in relation to resource and that is personnel, I suppose, in order to be able to do a lot of these things. But I don't think there's an, that it would be wasted asking again um, and, and asking them to be creative, as we have been doing right. for several weeks. Anything additional to that, Mr Boylan? No, Chair, that's fine. No, I think there's an opportunity here for, for monies. And I mean, 
just try and get them out if we can, you know. Okay, although I suppose we do have to appreciate that call has gone out round all the departments, so <laughs> no doubt what seems like a, a large pot will deplete quite quickly. Um, Mr Muir? Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, just following up on the stuff from Roy in relation to the capital, there is a potential for the budget next month to announce further capital funding. We would hope that. We would hope that a much better budget would come next month because of the situation that we have at the moment. But there's a real issue here about capacity from the department to be able to deliver upon uh, the investment that's required. So I think correspondence does need to go to the department around that resourcing and capacity issue. And touching upon also the other issues which have been raised just in terms of um, labour force availability, which was uh, in terms of more than water. These are significant issues. Um, you know, th at the, la the end of the last financial year, there was a significant amount of capital funding handed back because it couldn't be spent. And we can't have that. That's not acceptable. We need to be investing in our communities and helping to recover out of COVID. So these are, these are really, really, really key issues. And the practical demonstration we're seeing of that is in terms of roads maintenance at the present moment in time. At the end of a financial year, you would usually see quite a lot of projects being uh, undertaken. That's not happening at the moment, and we need to be able to take action in relation to that. Okay, thank you. Um, Mrs Kelly. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I, was just, I want a clarification. I think Ms Anderson said that there was coach operators who met the criteria but failed to get uh, funding. I, I, was that because there was a lack of uh, money in the pot overall, or, or yeah, okay. just wanted, I, I think they didn't meet the criteria. Yeah. Hold on. Well, okay. Okay, so Dolores, just to clarify your question. No, I was just. Uh, I take it that uh, Martina had said about people who had met the criteria but failed to get funding, coach operators. But I want a clarification on that. Because uh, if if there was not enough you know money in the pot and then it was done on a um, a scale you know of who, who got the biggest number of points if you like got the money and the others didn't uh, mm -hmm. I think we need some clarification on that yeah okay, Miss Anderson can you clarify Yeah I have been uh, engaging with a number of small coach operators Dolores and they're telling me that the threshold was forty percent. And for instance, there's one operator that spent nearly three thousand getting a consultant to verify uh, what, that they are viable and uh, and that they met that criteria. But when that was submitted, there was another layer of bureaucracy, as they would call it, that they didn't then meet. And they were saying, had they realised and had they been informed after spending all this money to meet what was originally designed and what they were originally informed about, they then find themselves, and it only seems to be happening to smaller coach operators, that they're not getting over um, that particular hurdle. So they're asking for the department to take into account that whilst they did meet the criteria of a 40% downturn, some of them were 50% and more, but that they ended up then resulting in when they were being assessed, not being eligible. So it's part of that learning for the department. So if they are developing a second scheme, that they rectify whatever obstacle was put in place for the smaller coach operators. Thanks very much, Wendy. That's very helpful. Thank you. And, and I think sort of the added challenge to all of this is that it was quite clear from last week's um, discussion that the majority of operators actually don't fall within either of the two um, sort of umbrella representative groups. So in some ways, perhaps the difficulties that they are experiencing may not be reflected. Um, so it's really about trying to have that engagement with them um, for either to understand the scheme or for the department to realise the difficulties that they are, they are having. Okay, so are members content that that's reflected? I suppose really all comments are reflected then in correspondence to the department. Okay, it is much more difficult to get of agreement on these things just because we are virtual. Um, Dolores, you still have your hand up, as does um, Cahill. No. Have you anything? Dolores? No, I'm okay, Chair, I'm okay. Okay, well, Dolores... Sure, I'm okay, I just didn't know to take my hand up. Well, actually, your okay. hand is all... You also, also have your hand up and it's frozen on my screen as well. No, <laughs> just I have it down here. <laughs> okay. Thank Sorry you. about that. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, we move on then to our next session. Um, can I remind members... Um, that I have to finish the meeting at noon. So that gives us 50 minutes. So if I do start to move you on, you'll appreciate um, the, that um, I'm doing it for um, the right reasons. So moving then to departmental briefing on common frameworks. And the first of these 
is the hazardous substances, which is the one obviously we're dealing with um, this morning. Uh, so can I welcome um, our witnesses via Starleaf? We have Brian Gorman, the operation, Operational Governance, and Aaron Kennedy, who is Head of Planning, Policy and Legislation Branch. Okay, um, you're both very welcome. Um, just um, as a, an introduction to that and for members' information, um, can I ask you just to turn to um, the various pieces of correspondence which we have received in relation to that? And I'll just do a summary um, for the record with regards to what that says. Um, we have a response from the House of Lords Common Framework Scrutiny Committee just with regards to hazardous substances planning framework. The House of Lords has advised that there are several parts of this framework which they welcome, although they have a number of concerns and two recommendations that they believe would facilitate future stakeholder engagement and parliamentary scrutiny of this framework. They recommend that the review should actively solicit input from a wide variety of stakeholders, including non-industry stakeholders, and a report from this review should be published and shared with the UK Parliament and devolved legislatures in order to facilitate future parliamentary scrutiny. Um, in the House of Commons, Housing Communities and Local Government Committee, they have reported that um, they made a call for evidence on the framework and have noted that it has not been a contentious except for a request from the Health and Safety Executive that the framework should include provision for consultation in the event of proposed legislative divergence. From the Welsh Parliament, their Climate Change, Environment and Rural Affairs Committee, um, they also called for stakeholder engagement and scrutiny as part of any review. And from the Scottish Parliament, their Local Government and Communities Committee, they have noted that while it was content the coming into force of a common framework in no way limits the right of a parliamentary committee or the parliament as a whole to scrutinise and debate operational matters dealt with under a framework that are within its remit or competency where there is public interest in doing so. So it's important just maybe for members to note that just in our, in our own reflections um, with regards to that. Uh, could I then move to, it? I'm assuming, uh, Brian, are you going to, to lead on this? Yes, yes, yes. Sure. So can I ask you then to make your introductory comments and then members, if you can then indicate um, if you desire to ask a question. So thank you, Brian. Certainly. Thank you, Chair and committee members. Um, thank you, obviously, for the invitation here today to further scrutinise the uh, land use planning hazardous substance common framework uh, after our, our initial meeting 16th of December. And as the Chair said, I'm joined by Aaron Kennedy, who has also been involved in this work. Uh, I think it's possibly worth briefly reiterating some of the key points from our initial discussions uh, in December, uh, and that is following UK departure from the European Union, there will be scope uh, in the future to develop policy and possibly legislation in areas which have previously been governed by EU law, but which are otherwise uh, within the area of competence of the devolved administrations. Uh, Future EU directives or amendment to directives may not automatically apply as they have done previously. And this means that there is therefore that potential for policy divergence across the four administrations uh, and in those areas that have previously been governed by common source EU directives. Now the work on the common frameworks uh, has been taken forward to provide a mechanism within which any such future discussions can be managed. Uh, it's important to highlight, which uh, I tried to at the initial meeting, but important to highlight that the framework itself and the work to date do not propose any policy or legislative changes in relation to the hazardous substances regime. Uh, what is intended is to put in place a process to deal with any potential future changes and possible divergence and to manage that uh, within the context of devolution. Uh, land use planning hazardous substances common framework has been developed in line with the overarching principles for common frameworks that have been agreed by the Joint Ministerial Council for European negotiations and those principles subsequently agreed by the Northern Ireland Executive. Uh, work with our colleagues in the other administrations has taken a realistic approach to accommodating any possible future divergence uh, which may be considered necessary to meet local needs and local priorities while seeking to support broad alignment in this area at a strategic level. At the last meeting, a number of issues were raised by the committee, including the timetabling of the scrutiny process and maintaining existing standards in the 
current hazardous substances regime. We're happy to revisit any of those points uh, if that might be useful. And of course, as with the other legislatures, we would welcome any recommendations from the committee. We will uh, forward any comments or recommendations received from the committee for discussion with the other administrations uh, in tandem with those you've already raised, Chair. The Lead Whitehall Department is keen to schedule another meeting of the four administrations to consider the results of scrutiny by each of the legislatures, and that's how we will see the process moving forward. I hope that's brief enough, so thank you. Okay, thank you, Brian. Um, obviously, um, we did have a, a briefing on this just, just prior to, um, to Christmas, but um, I suppose really, for the record, um, these are a sort of common um, minimum requirements, uh, and there may, of course, then be uh, a requirement for, for divergence. Could you maybe take the committee through the process for that and, and how agreement can be reached with regards to divergence? I think um, we have to bear in mind that we have our current extant legislation, and the legislation has been developed actually in advance of the uh, EU directive in this area. So there's a common um, interest in maintaining high standards. Uh, we have common work across Health and Safety Executive and Health and Safety Executive Northern Ireland to maintain this. I think where we may have possible areas of divergence. Um, Maybe if there is a change to an EU directive or if an administration finds uh, a previously unanticipated issue or consequence within the existing system. But there's generally, there's, there's no appetite, there, there's no drive at the minute to diverge from what the current system is. If that did emerge, then under the framework, each of the administrations has committed to keep the other administrations uh, up to date with issues and if they think any policy change is necessary. Basically, a no surprises uh, approach to this and then to call a meeting to discuss what the issue is and to see whether it, uh, it is common across the administrations. Uh, if it requires change, that might come as a change to an EU directive, as I say. But in the circumstances, to keep all of the administrations aware of an issue, possible policy change, and what an administration sought to take forward. If that were the case, and I don't see anything that uh, drives that thinking at the moment uh, within the Northern Ireland regime, then within the devolved settlement in each of the administrations, the normal policy development process, and if subsequently you require legislation, the legislative process still applies. So the process of public consultation, stakeholder engagement on any change, and the assembly process in managing legislation is still in place. And we would touch with the assembly and public scrutiny to those. But well, as I say, currently, uh, it is a mechanism to manage any possible future discussions well, we've no issues identified that may require that at the moment. Okay, one of the, 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 the common theme from um, each of the, the regions has been in relation to um, stakeholder in, um, engagement. Um, has there been any discussion as to how that um, could be improved or um, built into the processes? Or is that something which is obviously, um, I mean, you've said obviously around divergence, that would then be part of um, the, the normal um, piece of work that you would carry out um, in any change of policy or indeed um, um, amendments to legislation or new legislation. Um, I suppose I just really want to talk about sort of the broader piece around stakeholder engagement uh, and where, yes. where that seemed to be appropriate. Yes. Uh, for any policy development that we've taken forward and we've taken forward um, significant uh, elements of policy development, for example, through the transfer and uh, reform of planning powers, we would, in any policy area, identify who the key stakeholders are on that policy change and engage those through the public consultation, uh, engage with them directly where necessary, and that informs a decision on policy options going forward. And then additionally, if you think that legislative amendment is required, then the legislative process through the assembly is not just directly with the department, but the committee itself will engage with stakeholders on those issues. Uh, the stakeholder engagement to date on the framework has been led uh, by MHCLG, um, targeted at some of the key um, industries uh, associated with this. Uh, I know that in terms of all the recommendations from the legislatures, they have raised this, as you say, Chair, uh, stakeholder engagement. So it's one of the issues that we're more than happy to take forward for discussions with the other administrations in relation to the framework. Uh, but normal and stakeholder engagement, public consultation requirements, policy development and legislation remain unchanged should some change be considered necessary in the future. Okay, and, and just finally, um, can you maybe just outline what the next steps are with regards to this? 
Next steps, uh, as and when we receive recommendations from the committee, uh, MHCLG, it's the Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government, that's the lead Whitehall Department. They're keen to schedule a meeting of the four administrations, uh, at which point all of the uh, responses from the legislatures will be uh, considered. Uh, and then I think discussions of that meeting, feedback in terms of those options to move forward into operation and any amendments to the framework that might result from that. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Anderson. Uh, th thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, Brian, for, uh, for, for that overview. Uh, the draft fr framework proposes having a review and meeting between the British government and the North and the, so and the Scottish and Welsh institutions. Now, it says two years after the framework comes into effect. Um, yeah, I think that sort of meeting with us, you know, not just after the horse is bolted, you know, it is gone. Uh, so, and I know that some of the other um, committees, for instance, in Scotland and Wales, they've touched upon this and they say that two years is too long. So, yeah, can I ask about that particular uh, time frame? Because I think it's far too late to engage at that time. Certainly. Good morning. Um, at this, this point, it is uh, two years or shorter, if necessary, uh, in the framework. And I think that's partly informed because there are no there are no potential changes that we see on the horizon to the directive, which were, which had um, sort of, as I said, been the common source of the legislative provisions in each of the administrations. So there are no current issues in this regime um, that we anticipate would necessitate that meeting. But you know, if it needs to be, if something cropped up, we don't have to wait for the two years to elapse. If, on the basis of feedback from the legislatures, that wants to be revised more than happy to discuss that through the administration. So I, I see no issue with that in terms of changing it or reducing it, subject to the discussion with other administrations. So. Oh, well, Chair, I'm glad to hear there's no, going to be no anticipated changes. However, we were told that in relation to uh, workers' rights, and two weeks ago, we were told there's going to be a review of the 48-hour working week. So um, we just need to be mindful of this and keep an eye on it. And then if something does materialize, it comes, it comes back to the committee. I also noted that the draft framework states that the involvement of stakeholders um, in any review will be considered at that time. So I see other committees um, have touched upon this. So should the framework not include state stakeholder involvement in the review process from the outset? As I say, no issues with that. The, uh, the initial stakeholder engagement with this on as a pathfinder for the common frameworks was essentially MHCLG led. And, um, probably not as much local engagement as may have otherwise been if it had been more localised. So again, we have no issue with stakeholder engagement and we would fully anticipate Harry and myself have taken forward policy and legislative change to get the right policy objective. It's essential that you have key stakeholders, otherwise you run the risk of bringing forward proposals that actually aren't going to be effective and which could have been better informed by stakeholder engagement. So it's all the way through policy development and legislative development and that's why we've operated it. And as the Chair has said, we've had engagements with yourselves before. So the feedback, say for instance, from this committee and from other committees, are they being taken into account? Yes, that is the way ahead. Um, we will take each of the, we're aware of the responses from uh, both houses in Westminster, Scotland and Wales. So when we get the feedback from your committee, we'll bring those all together. MHCLG as the lead department will uh, coordinate that meeting and then we'll look at all of those, yes. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Brian. Okay, thank okay, you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Boylan. Thank you, Chair. Just a couple of questions. <clears throat> Just on page 200, um, between the UK government and the devolved administration set up a, a a set of nine principles for future ways of working that would make up the agreement. Um, is that is that the same way across all the frameworks? Uh, good morning. I'm not sure, um, as well, because we're not uh, involved in each of those. Uh, however, we have coordinated that work in terms of sharing the um, the uh, framework itself with the executive office. So uh, I can't say categorically that that's common to them, but we're keeping with the executive office and then the cabinet office for a while of this. So we, our focus has been in this framework, so I'm not fully aware of the detail of all of the others. Sound. And uh, Chairman, maybe we'll follow up on that to see is it the same right across the board. Um, Brian and, and I, and you, mm -hmm. you're, I meant to say you're welcome. Um, we're still at phase four. When will we um, get into phase five? Can you comment on that? 
Yeah, I think once the, all of the feedback from the legislatures have been addressed, then we move into the operation. And the operation is not a day-to-day -day operation. You know, it's it's where these issues would, ar would arise, in our view. This is not a, a day and daily contact through this because it's an area where there, we have no issues uh, on the horizon, as I say. It's just the ongoing contact with the administration as and when issues arise in a formal checkpoint meeting. And obviously, you indicated earlier on you'll keep the committee well informed of everything that's going through, as best yeah, you can. Yeah. Yes, um, and in fact, you know, the framework itself might be amended on the basis of the feedback from each of the legislatures uh, in terms of the recommendations. Just, uh, Brian, finally, um, I know this briefing is about houses is planning, but in terms of some of the other stuff that's involved in this committee, you know, interoperability and all real operability. Um, mm -hmm. Where are we in relation to that? Do you like to comment on when we find out anything with that or how is that? That I don't know. I'm not involved in those ones. Uh, and it, it seems uh, strange mix hazardous substances and then all of the transport. Um, the hazardous substances was once selected by Cabinet Office. Uh, right. It, it does not have that direct operational impact that you might anticipate in transport related issues. So uh, I think when our colleagues, um, who we have worked with in terms of the principles and how we want to take forward discussions, when they're coming from the committee, they'll be able to provide it, but I'm not up to speed with the details on those ones. No, no, that's fine. And obviously, Chair, that's, that's something Chair of the committee I just can maybe ask a question on. But thank you very much for your presentation. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Kimmins. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks, Brian. Like, just a couple of questions. Um, with reference to the hazardous framework, you'd say it on page 197, reducing standards is not in this way is not something that the industry um, has been pushing for is likely to pursue and the proposed approach is considered appropriate. So it's just, I take it the British government have not indicated any intention to divert or lower standards on this issue, have they? No, absolutely not. And in fact, there's a useful piece in the framework that the legislative provisions across all the administrations actually predate the EU directive. So the standards were there. Now you tend to find with some of the directives that they're um, either instigated or in reaction to a particular issue. So this was a, um, a particular accident, but the regimes across the uh, four administrations were in place predated that, and there's no current appetite to reduce those standards. What the framework says is that when you move away from the EU common source, there is the potential. You know, that's the reality of moving away from the common requirements of the EU directives, uh, and when you overlay the default uh, settlement. But there's no intention at the minute. There, there's nothing planned. There's nothing that would give rise to that at the minute that anyone comes aware of. Yeah, and I suppose then, what about all all policies with regard to the common framework? Say, so for example, um, one of the other briefings that say, said about a key British government EU, EU exit priority for rail was to have flexibility over technical standards. So, do you think that's something would be right across the board, or? Well, it's a bit like I've just said to Mr. Boylan, you know, I don't, uh, I'm not cited on the other frameworks. Um, I think when our colleagues come to the committee uh, on those other frameworks, the, the, the other five, uh, they might be able to deal with that issue. But we, we are only focused on the hazardous substances, one of them, I'm afraid. Okay. Um, well, thank you. I suppose regarding a scenario where the North would like to diverge, diverge with Britain and stay policy aligned with Europe, I think um, my colleague Martina maybe asked this question last week. Um, and we were told it would depend on the policy area. So just to see, could we get a breakdown then of that in terms of the hazardous framework or the, the real um, interoperability, for example, what would happen? Well, in terms of, I'll restrict it to the hazardous substances regime, you know, for anything that is within the planning regime, which is a devolved matter. So if there was an issue that was peculiar to Northern Ireland where we wanted to move away from what is common uh, convergence across the administrations under the framework we would advise the other administrations. As I said previously, there's no surprises to keep everybody up to date uh, and discuss that. But if there was an issue that was pertinent to the ball matter that we wanted to take forward, then subject to um, uh, the terms of devolution settlement, you can take that through. It might be a small area, it might be something significant, but again, that will be subject to policy and then the legislative process through the assembly itself within the devolved settlement. Okay, well, thank you. And I suppose just the last point, um, the third, it's around the third common framework. It states that the frameworks would ensure recognition of the economic and social linkages north and south. And we need to ensure that this principle is applied in practice, but have, have the department engaged with, with your counterparts in the south in relation to these common frameworks? 
Uh, not on this framework because this is planning, so it's territorially limited to Northern Ireland in terms of the legislation. Uh, where there are any potentials under the legislation on an operational manner for transboundary issues, that would be on an op a practical manner. But in terms of how we would manage policy going forward, um, that's just constrained by, across the four administrations. Um, I think engagement with other states would be more of an operational matter, and that's not dealt with under the framework. But it is dealt with under the legislation. So with that, if that were to be amended, that would be policy consideration development on a legislative amendment. Okay. Okay, no, thank you. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Beggs. Hello, again, Brian. Thanks for your presentation. Morning. It, it all seems to agree very what we're talking about, uh, how planning can interact with uh, hazardous substances. But you mentioned that this uh, area of um, planning legislation developed around uh, a major incident. I think to give us all a better picture of what this is about, could you um, advise us what was that incident that, that drove this type of planning? Yeah, it didn't drive the planning legislation, and maybe I've uh, misled you on that. The planning legislation was actually already in place. So the hazardous substances regime across the four administrations was already in place and predated the EU directive. And the EU directive, and this is a bit of a, a check my uh, history recall, I think was an industrial accident in Italy. Hence the name of the directive, Seviso. Uh, and it was a lack of control or concerns about control of packaged substances that then led to a broader EU review of that area. And um, the, as I say, the regimes across the four administrations predate that and had high standards already in place. Sometimes you find that across the EU that standards and regimes uh, are not at all the same levels as one incident that would bring it to the attention and then everybody. The, the approach of the directors has been to brought, bring everybody up to those minimum standards. Those minimum standards might already apply, might already be in place, and in such circumstances, then those member states had less to do to comply with the requirements of the directive. It, it, it's, it's good to hear that we already had those standards in place. Um, thanks. Okay. 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 Thank you. Um, no other member has, has indicated. Um, Brian and Ari, can I thank you both for your attendance this morning and um, the, the committee will follow up um, with its recommendations with regards to this. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Bye. Okay, members, um, just, I suppose, just to summarise, um, obviously there were concerns in relation to the, the, the time scale of the review. Um, I suppose just seeking sort of for further clarification just in relation to um, that point six uh, that Mr. Boylan raised around um, sort of the seem what seems to be sort of general principles, but whether or not they've been applied right across. But that's something maybe that we can check um, internally within um, um, within yeah, the, yeah, chair, the committee there's office. A set of nine, sorry, the set of nine principles. All right. So yes, yeah, that was part of point six of the um, on page two hundred. Okay, so we'll maybe just sort of check across each of the this, this, the um, the frameworks to see whether those are general principles which are being applied. Um, and the other point that you made was um, in relation to um, sort of the reduction of standards and so on. But I think that's probably quite clear um, in that that predated the directive. Was there another? Was there a further point that you want a clarification in relation to operability? Asking about it, you know, but obviously they, they were here to talk about the hazards of substance. Okay. But just, just in the main points, the nine principles. To be honest, you know. Okay. Um, obviously, we will be receiving briefings on on each of the frameworks, and they will that will be um, obviously um, between the um, staff and um, the department will um, coordinate when those briefings will take place. So, within in due course, we'll um, address all of those. Was there anything additional with re in respect to this, which is any different to what other um, jurisdictions are recommending? Or are we content to include those recommendations, obviously, with regards to stakeholder engagement as well? I'm just getting nods, so I'm assuming everybody's content with that. Nothing additional? Okay, great, thank you. Um, Madam Chair. Mr Beggs. Um, I had my hand raised, um, but it must be difficult managing Sorry. remotely. And, yeah, I'm going, um, I'm going between looking at the screens and mobile phones. And 
Um, um, the, the point was made there that there's a two-year plan process here uh, to put uh, the arrangements in place, um, but there, that there's the ability to shorten that if, if, if there is a need and issues arise. Two years, in my mind, seems a long, long time, and it might be better to um, see if that can be expedited so that should issues arise, everyone is in a better place to address them. Yeah, I think that there may be sort of a, a common approach with regards to that, and that they maybe there, there ha this has been raised as a concern. Although, as, as Brian said, if there is a particular issue, that that can be reduced. But probably in the first instance, and the point was made by Miss Anderson too, that perhaps an earlier review, um, and then perhaps then looking to something every two years might be something that they may want to consider. But maybe they may want to look at the initial review being in a short in a shorter period. Is that what you're suggesting as well? Chair, I agree with uh, what you've just outlined. I think the two years is too long, and I agree with what Rory is saying. It may, as it rolls forward, we may be comfortable enough as the scrutiny committee to be able to do that every few years. Um, but in the first instance, I do think it needs to be shorter so that we're across uh, what has taken place and that we can do our role and our scrutinising role properly and effectively. Okay, and that might be something that we may want to look at for, for each of the frameworks as well, just in, in the initial stages of this, because obviously every, it's, this is new to everyone. Okay, so members generally content? Okay, thank you. Moving then to our forward work, work programme, which is night, item nine. Um, if you go to page 218, um, next week we have... Um, very topical, um, roads maintenance and winter maintenance. And then we also have some outstanding um, briefings from um, research in order um, we want to spend some time looking at, at that as well. Members are content with the forward work programme at this stage. Obviously, this is very fluid. Okay. Um, do members have any other business? Chair, one bit. Mr Boylan? Yeah, Chair, I just have a put in writing, but I just want to raise it to Ed's. I've been contacted by the, by the taxi industry in relation to the operational hours over the weekends in Belfast. So I'll put it in writing. I just want to put that on record, OK? OK. Anyone else at this stage? No hands raised. OK, thank you. Um, the next week's meet, meeting will take place at 10 a.m. and We will be in the, the Senate chamber. And as I've said, we'll receive a departmental briefing on road structural maintenance and winter service, and also a briefing from Assembly Research on business models within um, UK and the Republic of Ireland water sector and electric vehicle waste. So if members are content, we shall adjourn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee.